So Foundry is a pretty complicated virtual tabletop to learn, and as I talked about in this video that I recently released where I reviewed Foundry, I mentioned that Foundry has a learning curve about as steep as a mountain goat's favorite hiking trail. But it doesn't have to be so complicated to learn. Because like you, at one point I was a complete beginner with using Foundry, so I looked up tutorial videos and player guides and things like that, but was a little overwhelmed when I saw how long some of those videos were, and was a little confused why they were covering some things in those videos that I would consider to be a little too advanced for an absolute beginner like I was, and perhaps like you are. So in this video, I'm going to give you a nice, smooth, simple game map master's guide for using Foundry as an absolute beginner and avoid all of the complicated stuff that you don't really need to know how to use at your current experience level. So let's get started. When you first start up Foundry, this is what you're going to see. You've got your game worlds, game systems, and mods. What you first want to do though before creating a world, which is where all the action happens, is to pick out your game system of choice that you want to use by going over here to game systems and clicking install system. And don't worry, Foundry probably has your preferred game system because there are nearly 300 available, and you can easily search for whichever one you want. For this tutorial though, we'll just install D and 5e. And now that we have it installed, we can start creating a game world. But before we do that, go over to the mods section and search for and install these mods. They will greatly help you out as a new Foundry user, our system agnostic, and they'll come up later. But anyways, then you can create a world super easily by going to game worlds, clicking create world, then filling out this form. You can call the world whatever you like, but make sure you select your game system here. And if you only have one downloaded, then only one should show up. But if you like to run multiple game systems and download them multiple, then they'll all show up right here. And as a note, once you make a world using a game system, System, you can't change the game system of that world, so choose wisely. But then you have the background image, which changes the image of the join screen, and this is what that looks like if you decide to change it, and then the join page theme, which can either be minimal or default. And finally, you can add when the next session is and a description of your world if you want to. But once you're done with that, you can create and join your world. By default, there is no password for you as the game master, so don't bother typing one in, and it's just that easy. So to get yourself oriented, I would definitely recommend taking the Foundry tour that should pop up in a brand new world, because it shows you what all these strange symbols are and where everything is located. But in the case where it didn't pop up for some reason, head over to settings, then go to tour management. But once you're done taking that tour, this is your game canvas, which would normally display some artwork, a landing screen, or a battle map, but right Right now, everything's blank, and we don't want our players obviously looking at a blank screen when they join, so let's get a scene set up. So to do that, go over to the Scene Directory tab, which is located right here, and click Create Scene. Give it a name, then choose what you want the background image to be. And for now, ignore the foreground image section and all this other stuff, so once you have your background image, just create the scenes so that way we can see what we're working with, and make sure that the grid's aligned and all that good stuff. So I'm going to use this wonderful map made by Dice Grimorium as an example, but as you can see, the grid is slightly unaligned. But this works as a great example for aligning the grid to your map in case this ever happens to you. So to fix this grid issue, you want to go back into the scene settings by left-clicking on it by default in the scene directory tab, or by right-clicking on it, then clicking configure. Then navigate over here to the grid section and click the little square symbol. It'll highlight the foundry grid so that you can easily tell where you're aligning. Then you can hold down Alt, then use scroll wheel to adjust the grid size or shift scroll wheel to adjust the image scale. But I'm gonna be honest here, I've rarely ever had to use the image scale when importing battle maps or artwork into foundry, so it'll probably be the same case for you. And unless your image is too small or too big for the foundry grid system, you will probably rarely ever use this feature. But the grid align tool does a pretty good job of recognizing the grid of a battle map and snapping to it once you get close, but sometimes it requires a a little bit of finagling. But once you have it aligned, you can save your changes and it'll send you back to the scene configuration where you can change the padding percentage, which is just the space around your battle map, the grid scale and units in case you want to set up a world map, the grid style, and even the color and opacity of the grid. And in the case where you want to create ambience by showing your player's artwork by using scenes, then just make the artwork that you want to display the background for that scene and copy these grid and lighting settings so that no grids show up and your players don't have to have any tokens on the map in order to see. And in case you want to, you can set what viewpoint the players will have when they load into a scene by using this button in the basics section. How it works is it sets the camera to whatever position and zoom you're currently at. And you may have already figured this out at this point, but if you want to change your camera position, you can use scroll wheel to adjust zoom and hold right click and move your mouse to move your position. And if you want to ping a location on your artwork or battle map to bring your player's attention to it, you can long press left click, or if you want to move your player's perspective to a particular point, you can hold shift and long press left click. And then finally, let's cover how to navigate between multiple scenes. When you right click a scene in the directory, you get these options. Viewing a scene means only you move to it. Activating a scene means that all players get moved to it. Toggling navigation means that it will appear in the navigation bar. And if you want to pull only one player to a scene, you right click their names in the player list and click pull to scene. And if you want to give players the ability to move between scenes themselves, such as between a battle map they're currently on and a world map or something, all you have to do is change the permissions in the scene settings and make sure it will show in navigation. And to give a quick tutorial for basic map creation, for a scene set in the overworld that is well lit, use terrain walls for large boulders, trees, and stuff like that, regular walls for buildings and stuff players can't see over or past, doors for, well, doors 
obviously, and invisible walls for windows and things players can see through. And for a scene that is well lit like this one, just keep the global illumination scene setting on and save yourself the trouble of having to set up tons of light sources. But for a dark scene like a dungeon that has no light sources besides your players and perhaps the occasional magical torch or something, you will probably not want to have global illumination on so that you can immerse your players in the scene. And if there are torches on the battle map that you want to emit light, just use the light tool. And for most battle map scenes you're creating, you probably want both of these scene settings enabled so that your players can see where they've been using Fog of War and they can see through their tokens. And for dungeon maps, I would put the darkness level anywhere between half and full to really set the scene. But now that we have a battle map, let's start placing tokens. But wait, you don't have any tokens yet. So let's find or make some. Basically, all tokens or actors will be in this tab, and you can either create one from scratch or use some of the pre-made ones that Foundry has by going over here to the Compendium tab. The Compendium tab is basically where all assets, rules, and other stuff for your game systems or mods will be. So if you ever download a mod that has some pre-made assets or something, this is where they'll be. And what's super nice is that you can easily search for whatever you want by using the search bar, or depending on your game system, there might also be a Compendium browser that you can use. But going back to tokens, we can open up this folder and select the Starter Heroes folder where there are quite a few pre-made player characters, or we can go to the Monsters folder and find some goblins or something. Similarly, we could also just use the Compendium browser. And there is no real right way to import these assets. You can click and drag them onto a map or into the Actors tab, or you can right-click them and click Import and so forth. But if you want to make your own custom character or NPC, then you just have to click Create Actor and follow your game system's rules for making a character. And you can click and drag features, spells, and items from the Compendium onto your character sheet to add them. But once you've done that, a character needs to have art artwork and a token to look nice on Foundry. So to give your character some artwork, all sheets in Foundry basically work the exact same way regardless of the game system, but D&D is a little different because they have this little edit slider up here. Click it to toggle edit mode, then click this icon here to assign some artwork. By default, the picture you choose will also be the token for your character, but if you don't like that, then you can go up here and click prototype token, then go to appearance, then change the image path to whatever artwork or token you want. Or if you already have a token on the map that you want to use, you can select the token, then select Assign Token. But regardless, be sure to click Update Token before closing this window. And pro tip, if you ever want to show the artwork of an NPC, character, item, or journal to your players, if you left-click on the artwork, a window will appear. Then you can click this little eye icon right here, which will display it to your players in a similar pop-up. Or if you want to cut out some steps, you can simply right-click on a character and click Show Artwork to access this window. But going back to the main character sheet or NPC sheet, if you want to roll an attack or make a saving throw or ability check or something, all you have to do is left-click on it and follow the prompts. And if it's an attack or spell, in chat a card will appear with all the buttons you need to roll for the attack or damage. And what's pretty cool is that if you left-click on a roll in chat, it will give you a breakdown of the roll complete with modifiers. But now that we have some tokens on the map, if you want to see from the perspective of a player token, just left-click it. But what the heck, why is everything so dark when I select them? Well, that's because the scene most likely has global illumination disabled. So if this situation happens to you, all you gotta do to fix it is go back to the scene's configuration menu and check this box. Some other common issues with token vision is the token not having this box checked in the token settings, and the lighting for the scene is too dark and the player characters don't have a light source or dark vision. So to fix this, you can give your players a torch or enable dark vision by following these steps. Go to a token settings by double right clicking on it if it's placed on the battle map, or by going to the prototype token settings like I showed you before. Before. Then go to the vision tab and mess around with these settings if you want to increase a player's vision range or you want to give them dark vision. But if a character doesn't have dark vision and the player wants to light a torch, go to the light tab and set the light radius to a standard torch brightness for D&D, which is 20 feet for bright and an additional 20 feet of dim. But what can be a little confusing is that both of these numbers originate from the token, so if you want an additional 20 feet of dim light on top of the bright light, then you'll need to set your dim light to 40, not 20. But then we can change the color to a nice torch color, like a kind of orange I guess, then set the animation to torch, which we can also customize. But if you want to move tokens around, it's pretty intuitive. All you have to do is left click and drag them, or use your arrow keys, or good old WASD. And a handy little tip for if you want to pull up the sheet of a character or NPC while you're on a battle map, all you have to do is select them and tap C on your keyboard, or double left click their tokens. But that's basically how tokens work. Now that you've set up some tokens for your players and tied them to their respective character sheets, you need to give your players ownership of them. To do this, right click a character in the actor's directory and configure the ownership so that way every player has limited access of the sheet, and one player is the owner of it. This way when a player first loads into your world, they can select their player character from the user configuration menu. But in the event where they accidentally don't do that, they can or you can assign a character to them by going to the bottom left of your screen and going to user configuration and then player character. And for clarification, you don't have to give limited access to every player for every character sheet. I just like to because giving limited access means that every player can view the token and portrait artwork as well as read the biography for a character. So for me, I feel like this is a great way for players to be able to refresh their memories on what each other's characters look like as well as being able to read the biography if they want to. But now that we've covered importing maps, artwork, 
tokens, items, and all that stuff, let's get into some of the other Game Master tools. For starters, all the tools you're going to be using as a Game Master to both interact with tokens and alter the map are going to be over here on the left-hand side, and in my opinion, they do a really good job of demonstrating how each of them are used and teaching you how to use them, so there's no real need for me to demonstrate them to you. But with that being said, some of these tools are very complicated to learn how to use, and sadly, none of the built-in Foundry tutorials currently really teach you how to use those mechanics. So if you want to see a video that's similar to this one, but is more directed towards using the tools and other features that Foundry has to offer, and is kind of more of a advanced Game Master's Guide to Foundry, then let me know by leaving a like. Or if you want to see a video that's similar to this one, but is more directed towards the player side of things, that way you can easily send your players a link to that video and get your players up to speed on how to use Foundry easily and quickly, then let me know by leaving a comment. But anyways, one thing I do want to share with you is that it will help you out so much in the long run if you choose to continue to use Foundry if you start to learn some of these super useful key bindings that Foundry has. So to help you out, I'm going to list some of the most common and useful ones that I think you should know how to use. So here we go. And as a note, be sure to be on the Select Tokens tool for these key bindings to work. For starters, hover over an enemy or ally token and press T to target. And if you want to target multiple tokens, hold Shift and press T. This will come up later when we talk about combat. And if you want to pause the game, which prevents all players from being able to interact with the battle map and their tokens, then press spacebar to pause the game and press it again to unpause. And I know, as I'm sure you know, that there's a lot of measuring that goes on in TTRPGs, and you'll be happy to hear that in Foundry, it's really easy to do. All you have to do is hold down Control and left click and drag to measure. Then left click again while still holding Control to make a joint in the measurement. And if you're not sure where all the tokens are, or perhaps where other objects are, then if you hold on Alt, it will highlight all objects for whatever tool you're using. And if you ever want to rotate something in Foundry, you can easily do so by holding down Shift or Control, then using Scroll Wheel to rotate whatever object you have selected. Hold down Shift for big movements, and hold down Control for little movements. And finally, you can copy and paste objects in Foundry just like on Windows, so you can easily copy something with Control C and paste it using Control V, and even redo an action using good old Control Z. But moving on, by default to roll dice in Foundry, you need to type in a command to chat, which normally looks something like this, but that's super clunky and annoying to do every time you want to have to roll a plain dice, so we're going to enable those mods from earlier to help us out. So, go over here to the settings tab, then click on manage modules, and check the box next to all of the mods that you want to enable, which in this case is all of them. So, click all of the boxes, then click save module settings, and it will warn you that the world will need to reload, but that's perfectly fine. Now, to kind of cover what each of these mods do, I would consider each of these mods to be a kind of gateway drug to using Foundry mods, so to speak. Because once you use these mods for a little bit and see what they're capable of, you begin thinking, oh, maybe there's a mod for this, or maybe there's a mod for that, and you will start hunting for mods, and you'll never stop. First, we have this handy dandy new dice roller down here that we can use to easily roll however many dice we want, plus modifiers. And with the chat commander mod, we can easily find commands we recently used in chat by pressing the up and down arrow keys, or if we type forward slash, it'll help us out by giving us some options to select from. Oh, and would you look at that, now we have 3D dice that we can completely customize by clicking this card in chat, or by going to configure settings. And finally, now navigating between scenes using monk scene navigation is completely customizable and much more intuitive than it was before. But if you see these mods and are itching for more recommendations, then you're in luck, because I've released a couple of mod related videos that showcase my favorites. So now we have a map, dice, tokens, and characters. So the next logical thing would be to roll for initiative. With the select token tool active, select all tokens that you want to participate in combat. Then right click one and click this little sword and shield icon right here. Then all tokens you selected should be put into the combat tracker, which is over here, the symbol of the two swords crossed, where you and your players can roll individually, or to save time you can click these buttons up here to roll for all NPCs or all combat participants. Then when you're ready, you can begin combat. And this is where targeting really comes into play, because in order for Foundry's automation features to work, you need to target an enemy or ally before you cast a spell or make an attack. And pro tip, I know us dungeon masters and game masters generally like to have a lot of journal entries or character sheets or NPC sheets open at one time, and if that's the case for you as well and you don't want to have to have your screen entirely cluttered up to the point where you can't see what's going on, then you can easily collapse any sort of pop-up in Foundry by double left clicking the top of it. Alternatively, you can click and drag features, attacks, spells, or even journal entries onto your macro bar down here to easily access them without having to open a character sheet or go over to the journal tab. But once you make an attack roll while an enemy or ally is targeted, Foundry will tell you if it hits or misses, and you can choose how you want to apply the damage, which makes things so much quicker than playing in person with no VTT. Additionally, if a player casts a spell by clicking on it on their character sheet, and the spell requires a saving throw, simply select the token of the creature targeted by the attack or spell, and click the saving throw button in chat that's associated with that spell once a player casts it. Then Foundry will automatically roll a dice for you and tell you if you succeeded or not. And in case you're curious, players can't see the success or failure banner by default. As you can see, Foundry makes things so much quicker, especially when it comes to combat with all these quality of life features, and if you're anything like me, these features will quickly become your favorite parts about using Foundry. But if you're a game
game master who likes to hide your dice rolls, then you can just change your roll mode down here to private GM roll, which means your players can't see your dice rolls anymore. And to give you a brief summary of what each of these modes do, public means anyone can see the roll, private GM means that any player who rolled the dice and the GM can see the roll, blind means that only the game master can see the roll, and self roll means that only you can see the roll. And in the case where a player accidentally rolled blindly or privately but wants to be able to see the roll, then you can easily change that by right clicking on it in chat and revealing it. But moving on to these other tabs here, the items tab is where all of the items that you have either created, want to save, or have imported from the compendium will show up. And as always, you can click and drag items from a character sheet into this menu if you want to. And you can even configure their ownership. But as a note, these items are technically different than the ones that are on an NPC or character sheet, so you don't have to give a player ownership of an item and import it into this menu in order for them to use it. As long as it's on their character sheet, you're good and they can use it. Next up is the Journals tab, which is where all players' journals will appear, and if you're running a pre-made adventure, those journals and handouts will also appear here. By default, players can't make their own journals, meaning that you have to create one and give them ownership of it. But if you want players to be able to create their own journals, then you have to go to Configure Settings and open the Permissions menu, then allow players to be able to create their own journal. Next up are Roll Tables, which are pretty nice if you're a game master who likes to use random encounter tables. And luckily, these roll tables are pretty simple, yet tedious to set up. So if you want pre-made ones, there are some mods out there that import a bunch of really good pre-made random encounter tables. But to use this tool, basically you just add however many outcomes you want, give it a range and add a formula, which is basically just the number of outcomes that you just put in. Then you click roll, which will give you an outcome. Then you have the card tool, and my advice to you as an absolute beginner is, don't waste your time trying to learn how to use this feature to its fullest extent and make your own card decks and things like that, it's just not really worth learning how to do right now. But if you can't resist, just use the pre-made ones that Foundry has built in. So moving on, now we got the music tool and to use this feature you first want to create a playlist or two then once you find some music you like and download it you can import those tracks into each of their respective playlists and i would recommend setting the fade duration of each track to at least 2000 milliseconds so that if you need to stop the music or transition to a different playlist there's at least two seconds of transition but if you don't know where to find music for your games or perhaps just want a good example of how to set up your playlists michael gelfie and tabletop rpg music have fantastic mods that are free and add tons of pre-made playlists to your games for every possible scenario and as a note if you end up downloading these asset mods don't forget to enable them and manage modules and import all of their content from the compendium. And then finally, the settings tab, which you may have already been to at this point and is pretty self-explanatory, but as a beginner, I want to show you some things that you definitely need to know about. First up is configure settings. This is where all of your foundry, game system, and module settings will be, because with most game systems and mods, there are normally tons of settings that you can tweak to personalize them. And as I'm sure you probably already know, everyone in every table tends to play their game system a little differently from the base rules. So be sure to visit your game system settings tab and take a look at the rules, settings, and features that you can enable or change to best fit your ideal game session. So what I'd recommend is that when you first create a world and get everything set up for your players, take a stroll through the configure settings window and see what your options are. Then once you're done with that, maybe tweak some key bindings in the configure controls menu. And lastly, set up a game master password for yourself by going to user management. For my game sessions, I only really bother giving myself a password since I have a lot of secrets I need to hide from my players. And why would a player want to log into another player's account? I don't know, but maybe they would. So if you want to, or if your players want their own passwords, this is where you can set that up for them. And regarding the roles, we won't really cover that in this video since I'd say that goes beyond the realm of a beginner, but basically you could enable certain tools and features that Foundry has to be enabled for some roles and not others, such as like creating journals like I showed you earlier. And as a final note, if your internet connection isn't very good or you aren't comfortable port forwarding, then I'd recommend checking out some of the third party hosts that Foundry is partnered with. And there you have it, everything that you need to know about setting up your game sessions using Foundry Virtual Tabletop as an absolute beginner. I hope this video was helpful. If it was, consider leaving a like and a comment down below in regards to how this video was helpful to you or what you really like about Foundry, or if you're an experienced Foundry user, what are your beginner tips? Regardless though, consider subscribing, and I hope to see you in the next video. Take it easy. Bye bye